Hello, everybody. My name is Stephen Cook, and I'm a professor at Carleton University in the Faculty of Science. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Science Cafe event. Uh, as you recall, these are events that we often do at the public library, but given the current pandemic situation, we are delivering these online. This will be recorded, so you're able to view it afterwards if you would like. And uh, we encourage you to check out the other Science Cafe events that are on the horizon. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome one of our newest faculty members, Dr. Vivian Nguyen. And today, she's going to be talking about where uh, the afterlife of science. And this is something that a lot of us think about. As scientists, we're trying to generate new knowledge and we're well known for writing papers. And those papers end up on shelves in libraries. And the question is, what happens with that information? Uh, does, it, does it get used or does it go to the library uh, where, it, where it basically wallows forever, uh, only to be read by the uh, odd academic uh, some, at some point. Uh, Vivian has had uh, really a, quite a fascinating educational journey that's taken her all over the world. Uh, in particular, I wanna note the fact that her master's degree really spanned the natural and social sciences. She studied the migration biology of Pacific salmon and did so with one chapter that focused on the fish themselves, including some movement ecology and physiology, work she did in the Fraser River. But then she also did a chapter focused on the human dimension. So she walked up and down the shores of the Fraser River, interviewing anglers understanding uh, the uh, human dimension aspects of recreational fisheries management as it related to, uh, to Pacific salmon. And so one of the first theses uh, that, uh, that we've seen lately that really brings together those natural and social sciences. That was about 10 years ago and, and that helped to uh, normalize that as a, a way of doing science, crossing that, that boundary uh, between natural and social sciences. Uh, Vivian did a PhD focused on knowledge mobilization, understanding how knowledge moves between the knowledge generators and the knowledge users. And I'm sure she's gonna hit on that today. And then she did a postdoc uh, with Natural Resources Canada, a federal agency. She had a MyTax Policy Fellowship where she was able to apply the information that she learned from her PhD, which was conducted here actually at Carleton, uh, to very real world situations. Vivian joined the professoriate back in September of this year, and we're thrilled to have her, sorry, that was last year now, so we're one year in. Uh, we're thrilled to have her at Carleton, where she is a professor in the Institute of Environmental and Interdisciplinary Science. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Vivian. I'm looking forward to your presentation. I'd like to remind our viewers that if you have questions, uh, that you can fire them into the Q&A session. Uh, we'll tackle those at the end of the uh, at the end of Vivian's presentation. But you're welcome to put presentation uh, questions in there as they pop up, uh, so that you don't forget them. And so with that, I'm going to shut off my audio and look forward to listening to Vivian's presentation. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for the introduction. Can everyone hear me? I guess I can't see anyone. So if no one can hear me. Please say something. <laughs> Um, again, thank you, Steve. So I am an assistant professor in the Institute of Environmental and Interdisciplinary Science. I hope everyone can see my title slide here. Um, so I was hired last year, one year ago, as one of two full-time faculty members in our new undergraduate program called ISAP, which is the Interdisciplinary Science and Practice Program we launched last fall. And so most of my research program is housed in the biology department, so it's a little bit <laughs> complicated. Um, because most of my research relates to conservation and natural resource management, as Steve mentioned, um, I worked a lot with fisheries. And so that's important to note because a lot of my perspective and um, examples do come from that conservation science lens, as well as lens of applied science. Uh, Steve did a great job in introducing myself, so, <laughs> um, so I won't dwell on that, um, but as he mentioned, I do study the movement and knowledge and how it can influence behavior as well as policy and practice, and then my work does uh, intersect the biology or ecology and sociology. 
Um, and so today, what we're going to talk about for our science cafe, I guess this is the first one for the fall, is uh, the science afterlife, asking the question, where does it go after it leaves the lab or leaves the field um, and is written up? Before we dive into today's topic, I just wanted to um, kind of talk about our perception of science. I did a quick Google image of what science is, and this is the screenshot I got. Oftentimes, science is depicted as beakers, lab coats, uh, microscopes, uh, uh, molecules. And so what I wanted to talk about today is to look at it uh, from a more, look at science more broadly, um, which includes the social sciences. Specifically, um, I'll talk about how people interact with scientific information and how social sciences help us understand uh, more the people side of, of science and how they interact with science. So the question, where does science go? To answer this, today's Science Cafe topic, I'll touch on um, a number of topics, including science for who and for what. So talking about people, how they interact with science, as I mentioned, and how do we track where science goes? What kind of tools can we use or approaches can we use to understand where science um, might end up? And lastly, if we have time, I do want to talk about potentially new approaches that scientists and researchers are doing um, to direct where, uh, where scientific information can go and where it can affect change. So we often hear science is the pursuit of knowledge and researchers, uh, as researchers, we use the scientific method to systematically gather knowledge about a phenomena or understand the world around us. As you can see in the picture, it kind of ends at this conclusion here. So then what? Well, um, oftentimes we communicate our findings and our conclusions. Um, and so the first topic here is science for who? Who do we communicate our science to? Uh, traditionally, most often um, as researchers, the currency for, um, for science or for communicating science is in peer reviewed journals uh, communicating to our scientific peers. And then most often as well, communication traditionally has been a one-way pipeline model because we rely mainly on this currency, this uh, um, academic journals here. So we, as knowledge generators, researchers and scientists, um, we hope that as we publish a, in a peer-reviewed journal, that it's accessible to people and that um, knowledge users, so our peers, stakeholders, or decision makers would pick it up and use it. More and more now there's attention to communicating to the public. Um, however, there is a lot of debate around how, to, how, around how do we do that and if it's actually working. Um, so what I wanted to bring up here is this article that I thought was very interesting um, related to science communication to the public. It's an article in the Slate um, that has this message that says, scientists stop thinking that explaining science will fix things. So I've taken an, a little excerpt from the, the article here uh, just, to, um, uh, just to highlight the key message, which is increasing science literacy alone won't change minds. Basically, um, knowing more doesn't mean it's going to change anything. In fact, well-meaning attempts by scientists to inform the public might even backfire. Presenting facts that conflict with an individual's worldview, it turns out, can cause people to dig in further. Psychologists aptly dub this the backfire effect. Um, so that's something I will touch on in a minute. So this article I mentioned here earlier is based on the notion that researchers and scientists are using something called the deficit model, where um, we rely on experts versus non-experts. Uh, this model where um, more, it, it assumes that more knowledge means more science literacy and more acceptance of science, uh, scientific evidence. But what happens, as alluded to by that article, is that the deficit model can lead to something called the backfire effect. It's a psychological phenomenon that occurs when contradicting evidence challenges our deepest convictions. So our beliefs get stronger and trigger an emotional um, response rather than a reasoned response. And what I like here, so this is the backfire effect explained in the comic um, from the oatmeal. It's a really good comic. 
And um, so what it says is that the way that we explain this or the comic explains is that your brain loves consistency and it builds your worldview uh, like we build a house. So as you can see, life experiences, your family, your upbringing, hatred for cilantro maybe. And um, if a new piece is introduced and it doesn't fit in this house that you built, uh, the house will fall apart. And so what happened was with this backfire effect is that your brain protects you by rejecting this piece, builds um, a fence around it and refuses to let any visitors in. And this is why we have the backfire effect, the biological way of protecting your worldview. It's, uh, it's almost like a psychological fight or flight response. For that reason, we see a lot of controversy or a lot of conflict, uh, conflict around different um, issues, such as, as we see now with COVID and, of course, with climate science and climate change. Uh, here's another comic that I liked. I had to throw it in, but it's basically your brain versus your heart as well. So your brain here is saying, you know, heart, there's new research into heart disease that says, like, basically everything's poisonous. Um, but the heart is like, let me stop you there. If you're making me choose between pizza and you, it's always going to be pizza. And so I'm hoping that everyone can kind of relate to that. For me, it's like instant noodles. I know it's bad for me, but I still eat it. Um, but the message is science is not the only information that is used to make decisions. And we all know this. Um, I know that we expect more, for example, decision makers and policy makers to um, there is more expectation for them to make decisions on evidence, um, but we're all humans, so there are lots of other factors that come into play. And so if science is not everything, what is? Um, here I want to talk, uh, walk through one example, and as Steve alluded to earlier, I did a lot of work during my graduate studies on the Fraser River out in BC on sockeye salmon. For those of you unfamiliar with salmon, um, they are born in freshwater, they go out to the ocean and they come back to freshwater uh, to spawn. So they have a cyclical and predictable pattern. And what happened in 2009, which is over, over a decade ago, uh, there was a class. So essentially um, fisheries managers can predict how many uh, fish come back to the river, but millions disappeared and we don't know what happened. And so with this case study, it makes, uh, it, makes it an interesting case for uh, social scientists, for example, to understand how people use or what people use to form their opinions about uh, this disaster or this event. Um, before I go into it even more, what I what we did is what uh, conducted interviews with salmon stakeholders, so people who are interested in salmon. In this particular fishery, we have recreational, commercial, and First Nation fishers who all fish for salmon. We have other people who are interested, including NGOs, the general public, fish processors, scientists, and of course, um, managers who manage uh, the fishery. And with hum humans are diverse and complex, and with all these different groups comes a mix of different social factors that play uh, come into play, like different motivations, different influences, sociodemographics, values and belief systems. Um, and so, uh, so it becomes quite a complex landscape. So as I mentioned, we, um, we conducted interviews with about 50 managers and stakeholders. And what um, I was interested in is how do these participants um, in our study form their opinions about salmon threats or salmon declines? I just wanna bring your attention to uh, some of these media clips here because there are lots of con um, conflicting information as well in the media, which makes it interesting. For example, here, um, one article says, is a virus ravaging BC sockeye? Then it's like, oh, maybe it's warm water threatening the Fraser River sockeye. And then you have one here that says, well, actually uh, scientific experts say fish virus pose low risk to sockeye. So as you can see, it does make a really interesting case um, to understand this phenomena of how do people form opinions, how do they consume um, scientific information. So I won't dwell too much on, um, on the methods, but the take home message or what we found um, as the top three responses from our participants were that 
Um, they form their opinion on salmon threats based on first their professional experience. So many, for example, managers um, experiences associated with their job. Second one was personal experience. Uh, so firsthand observations, being on the water every day. And then third was science, so original or secondary research. And so that's just an example to show again that the take home message is most of our participants based their opinions about this phenomena or this threat of salmon or declines of salmon on um, knowledge acquired from their experience, as we see here, life experiences more so than on science. Uh, and that's not surprising. So for example, we've used, as science is viewed as explicit knowledge, which is knowledge that you can actually see, you can read, um, and explicit knowledge only really makes up 20% of knowledge that is out there. And 80% of knowledge, which is tacit, is hidden under, as you can see here, under the water. It's uh, personal knowledge, emotions, intuition, and so, um, so these different types of knowledge will interact uh, to, to influence where science might go or how it is interpreted. A second example here um, with the same case, the Fraser River salmon case, here I wanted to know, well, let's say people are specifically looking for scientific information, where would they go to first? What's their go-to source? And um, what we did again is uh, conduct interviews, the same interviews, and uh, left it pretty open. So we asked managers and stakeholders, you know, where do you go to first when you want to find out more about science? And so with that, we were able to code the responses. And the key take home here are these sort of patterns that I've, hi I've highlighted here. Um, most managers and stakeholders go to their social network, as you can see. Um, managers really rely on their colleagues within their organizations. And then stakeholders rely on experts that they know, not so much experts that they don't know, but um, experts that they know. So this is interesting for researchers who, who want to have an influence on, on, um, on policy or practices, is that if you are a well-known expert within a, a certain network who uses your information or your science, um, that could go a long way. So, um, so social networks are more important here than academic resources. And I just put two quotes on here just to give you, describe a little bit more about what people are thinking behind the social network. So one stakeholder has said, papers, so academic papers are not clear. So when I read through it, it's not what I need. My network is my biggest resource of knowledge. Access to publications costs too much. So again, even with journal articles, some people have to pay um, to access your work. A second uh, stakeholder is saying here, I don't like to re rely on the internet, summaries or abstracts. I rely on my peer group, the people I have worked with. And so the take home message here from those uh, trends are that the science communication universe for salmon managers and stakeholders are much different from uh, scientists. Peer review publications are secondary or even tertiary. And so most people rely on their social network as the primary source um, of inform uh, scientific information and mostly because uh, it's accessible and there's trust that has been built between uh, the knowledge source and, um, and the recipient. So all that to say is that the knowledge deficit model is outdated um, based on some of our findings as well as um, research in the field of sociology of science. Um, what is more becoming more popular is the dialogue model where there is a two way conversation where researchers are listening and now considering values, beliefs, traits and the human dimensions of, um, of science or communication. Also, as I mentioned earlier, we were using the pipeline model where we're relying a lot on the scientific um, publications and journals to communicate our work. And now we know that that also is outdated. Um, sociology and, and theories from social sciences has, um, has 
uh, illustrated that knowledge is a social process. The, uh, the movement of knowledge is quite complex. As you can, um, as I mentioned earlier with the iceberg, you have, uh, you know, scientific or explicit knowledge only as a 20%, but you have all this other knowledge under, under the water that interacts with science, but also users also interact with each other. And so it makes it quite a complex web where knowledge can be interpreted differently. It could get stuck, it could get mutated. And so, um, and so social sciences can help us untangle some of these complexities. Um, just switching gears a tiny bit, I, in addition to that complexity, science, the scientific landscape today is also changing. Um, the world is complex. I mean, it's always been complex, but it's becoming more and more complex. And um, we see more and more people want to be involved in science. There's a lot of competing information. So in this cartoon, we have a scientist here and this guy is like, nah, -uh, some guy on Twitter just said you were wrong. And so there's lots of competing information. For example, as well, the internet, uh, thanks to the internet, everyone can have the knowledge I got from my expensive degree. Basically, there's a lot of information out there. The March for Science, a picture here, kind of depicts more demand um, for people to be involved, for evidence-based decisions and policies. And more and more, um, the next generation of scientists, they want to affect change. And so how can we do that? And so what I want to talk about next is science for what? Um, just to give a comparison of, before, of then and now, um, why do we communicate science? Well, back then, science communication was there for education and entertainment. Its main purpose was to make science accessible to non-experts. So we have an example of Bill Nye, the science guy um, in the 90s. You know, uh, for those of you who used to watch him, he was more for, you know, education, entertaining, increasing awareness. And then science communication was not there at the time to make a difference, to have a chance to influence policy or behavior change like it has evolved to today. This has become more and more important today. So you see Bill Nye, the science guy in the 2010s with the science for the common good in this picture down here. And so there is now this social contract for science. Um, James Chenko, who's a prominent environmental scientist, published an essay in Science in 1998, where basically she put an urgency to a call out for scientists to put their knowledge or put their research to use. Um, she said in her essay, scientists today are privileged to be able to indulge their passions for science and simultaneously to provide something useful to society. And she said, with these privileges, of course, comes serious responsibility. And so more and more um, science, there is a lot of science for curiosity, but there's now more and more expectations um, for science to contribute to society. And so there's this, now this new contract. Um, another, uh, I guess, other changes that are happening on the scientific landscape is that issues we are facing today are, are known as wicked issues where there it's complex, there's not a one solution, it's multifaceted. And especially when we're looking at environmental science or conservation science, um, linkages between society, nature, su such as social, political, economic, biological, geological systems, uh, present new challenges for researchers. Um, there's a greater call for interdisciplinary approaches to develop innovative solutions and a need for socially robust uh, scientific, scientific knowledge and solutions. And when I say socially robust, um, like it or not, um, more and more people, we need to have people buy in if we are to solve some of um, the issues uh, that face society today. And so the role of uh, social sciences can come into play by addressing some of these complexities. Uh, very simplified here, uh, solutions often are revealed by natural sciences, um, but implementation of these solutions often require the social sciences and we need these two to work together. Uh, for example, vaccines, you know, um, we use the lab to generate vaccines, but then when it comes out into society, you have such a polarized view on 
on whether it's good or not. So the social sciences can help us. And so studying people matters if we are, again, to solve today's wicked problems. So lastly, I wanna go into how do we, um, how can we understand where science goes and talk about some of these social sciences methods. Here I've shown um, a great figure developed by um, Nathan Bennett and his co-authors. Nathan Bennett is a conservation social, social scientist at UBC. And it's just a summary of essentially uh, disciplines in the social sciences and what it can help us understand. So we can understand social phenomena such as worldviews, as I mentioned earlier, ideas, narratives, socioeconomics, power, governance, um, really understanding policy as well. We can use social sciences to understand social processes understanding decision making how do we come to certain decisions how do what affects decision making you know management um, as i mentioned earlier fisheries management we use some of the social science approaches to understand that and lastly to understand individual attributes values and beliefs of individuals their behavior how do these all link together um, oops, sorry let's get through there and so especially in conservation and natural resource management, um, social sciences are important and can help us ask certain questions. Um, these are just some examples. Um, for example, what is the public perception of an issue? Um, you know, what do people think about vaccines? What do they th think about uh, genetically modified foods or organisms? You know, what values do the public or stakeholders associate with a resource? How important is it to them? You know, what trade-offs are decisions, uh, decision makers, stakeholders, or the public at large willing to make? You know, um, are they willing to invest in more research or invest in, uh, in something else? And what's the best way to communicate to certain audiences? These are just some examples of what the social sciences can help us uh, understand. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we're moving towards the dialogue model. So, this, so using social science approaches, we can enable this model. Um, and I have a third example here, which is one related to um, turtle bycatch in an Eastern Ontario hoop net fishery, not far from Ottawa. Uh, the hoop net fishery is quite small scale. Uh, it catches panfish such as sunfish um, and bluegill and sending it to Vegas, I think. And so um, what happens is this is what the, the nets would look like. So they are submerged underwater. There are these stakes at the end here. And these are the little hoop nets that are stretched out. And what happens is fish will hit the wings of these nets and get funneled into, um, into the nets. But in addition to that, we have also captured, well, not we, but we have seen that turtles also get trapped into these nets because they often follow fish in, into the net or just follow these wings. And if they are submerged underwater, there's potential for turtles to drown as, as of course, you know, they need air. And so as I mentioned earlier, biology helps reveal solutions. And working with um, a colleague of mine, Sarah LaRock, this was some of her uh, graduate work she used ecology, her understanding of ecology to develop solutions um, to mitigate this bycatch issue. So her first design was uh, vertical exclusion bars. Because they have the carapace, um, she thought maybe these bars would prevent turtles from coming into the net, but still allow these fish who are very narrow to, uh, to fit through into the net. She's also tried uh, an escape door, understanding turtle ecology knowing that they're gonna try and reach the surface, can, sh can we put these escape doors for them to find a way out of the net if they get caught? Um, another version of this escape door is the escape chimney. Um, so she's added a chimney to this escape door to allow turtles to escape. Uh, the reason why the difference between escape door and escape chimney is, um, is because that she wanted to know which one would uh, lose less number of fish that was caught. 
And so biology can, um, as I mentioned, uh, come up with some solutions, but uh, social sciences can help implement some of these solutions. And uh, coming up with socially robust solutions, as I mentioned earlier, this terminology, getting by in and working with uh, some of the users or the fishers. So working with Sarah, um, we conducted, I conducted 44 interviews with commercial fishers in this fishery to help understand and document their perspectives of bycatch and these devices that, um, that she designed. Um, not surprisingly, we, had, we got negative, uh, more negative responses than positive, I think, but it was really enlightening. For example, we know that people were very concerned about the decrease in catch efficiency of the fish. There were highlights of impracticality of you know, some fishers are setting really deep nets, some are setting shallower ones, you know, with this escape chimney, um, how is that practical? You know, it could be dangerous, nets can get, uh, you know, folded over, it could be too heavy, for example. And so working alongside with these users, kind of in that dialogue model, really helps enhance some of the uh, uh, scientific research and design that we were working on. And I also want to draw your attention towards these alternative responses. Surprisingly, we did not, we didn't even know that there were already fishers that had some of their own solutions. For example, someone mentioned they insert a beach ball into the net to allow it a pocket of air to float to the surface and allow um, a little air pocket for turtles to breathe. And so this was really uh, great to know because then we can work with this, these fishers who are willing to try different methods. Uh, to mitigate some of these bycatch issues. Um, so the take home here is social science studies can help us integrate user perspectives, their knowledge, their experiences on the ground with some of the natural science work. Um, the social sciences can also play a role in, in helping with that dialogue model by considering, considering values, beliefs, and other attributes of um, people who are going to be using some of the solutions. And so in summary, this is sort of a little evolution of science communication models. As I mentioned, the knowledge deficit model is uh, outdated. We moved towards a dialogue and engagement model. But there's this one last one I do want to touch on really quickly, um, which is called the participatory model, where both um, scientists, researchers, and users, or the audience, are on equal grounds and have equal partnerships and there's feedback where both are listening to each other um, and, and kind of like a feedback loop. So just some examples of emerging approaches to research, um, these participatory approaches uh, often focus on building relationships, building trust and um, are founded on equal partnerships. For example, uh, more and more researchers are leaning towards co-production of knowledge, so working with relevant users to co-produce um, research. Um, and again, that helps build relationship, better knowledge exchange, build trust. Uh, this is just some photos when I went up to Nunavut and we spent a lot of time with um, the community, with knowledge users to understand their needs and, uh, and build that relationship. Of course, there's also citizen science working with, um, you know, communities um, uh, and Canadians or citizens to gather information and gather scientific uh, data. Uh, one other one that I wanted to touch on that I've recently just been um, exposed to is something called the Living Labs, where um, researchers are actually going into the real, I guess, real um, like a real life context for, uh, for users. And so I'm working with Agriculture Canada right now where researchers are conducting their experiments and their research alongside um, farmers on their field. And so there, it's a user-centered innovation approach. It's working in partnerships, equal partnerships, and applying some of the research in a real life context. And I just wanted to throw this in here. Hannah Mead is uh, one of our collaborators. She works with anglers in Florida on shark fishing and, and goes out every single day with them to catch fish, uh, catch shark. And they've been um, working together uh, quite closely. And so I just found here on the, an Instagram post from one of the anglers is that 
she's gaining streak cred. I guess they're biting off a uh, head of a fish or something. I tried to click on the, to look at the video again, but the Instagram was like, this is very graphic. So I probably won't, don't want to show you the video. <laughs> but basically here it says, respect is earned and never given. Um, this is from the angler. Much respect uh, for the toughest scientists I know. And then they chant, one of us, one of us. So it's an interesting um, approach and more and more researchers are working closely with, uh, with knowledge users. And so in conclusion, where does the science go? Um, so for who, the people, setting people matter to fulfill our, that science is social contract. You know, the scientific landscape is changing. Social sciences can help us unpack some of the complexity um, in today's issues. And interdisciplinary work among social and natural scientists will, uh, can help better direct where science may go and how it may be used and influence um, actions, policies, behaviors. And with that, um, I can take questions and I would love to acknowledge uh, some of our co-authors, the different organizations we've worked with and all the participants in our study. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Vivian. Uh, on behalf of all of the audience members, uh, a, a big thank you. Uh, I know that if we clap, uh, only I'm the only one that you can hear clapping, but I'm sure everybody else is, is clapping as well. Thank you. Uh, I think Vivian hit on a number of really, really key points. And scientists were increasingly figuring out that if we focus only on the natural science, we're missing a really big part of the equation. And also, it's about rethinking how we do science. That's a big part of it, too. So some really great themes and messages uh, that have come out of here. Uh, I think broadly of interest, but also I know there's a number of students that are, are uh, taking in this uh, webinar today, and I think that those messages are particularly relevant to them as well. And so with that, we're going to transition to the question and answer period. And I'm going to start with uh, a question from, uh, from Barbara that says, what is the role of the media, e.g. newspapers, in science communication and miscommunication? Uh, that's a really great question. They do have a huge role in it. Um, we haven't, my, personally, myself, I haven't studied, you know, the extent of how much the media can influence um, you know, the perception of science, misinformation. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, there's always contradicting information in the media. And even just from personal experience, uh, just talking to my dad, for example, like uh, he, he believes everything sometimes the media says. And so I think they do have a, a huge influence on science communication. Um, but personally, I have not um, dove into you know, even measuring the extent of that influence, but I, it is an interesting one. Great. The next question comes from Michael, and he's asking, what is the basis for the assertion that explicit knowledge is around 20% versus 80% being tacit knowledge? You suggest that those seem to be uh, difficult things to measure, difficult concepts to measure. So thoughts on that? <laughs> yes, um, I don't think the 20 and 80 percent are like are meant to be, uh, you know, very uh, exact measures of it. It's uh, just a rough, I think, rough I, rule of thumb that this is kind of what people have observed in the field is that about 20 percent or quarter is explicit knowledge where we can see, but a lot of it is um, hidden. And so I can't really comment on on the actual measure of, of of the extent of these two different types of knowledge, but that's um, kind of the rule of thumb in the literature. Cool. All right. And our next question comes from Shirley, and it says, if we had a way to remove paywalls, so paywalls being uh, the subscription fees needed to access journals uh, where we publish our work, how would better access to quality peer-reviewed info change things? If we are able to remove those uh, paywalls? Right, so let's pretend everything's open access, Everybody yeah. can access all of our science freely online, uh, you know, things that have been through peer review. Uh, is that going to change anything? Giving people access, is that sufficient? 
Um, uh, that's a really good question and one that requires seeing into the future, but um, I, there is certainly a movement towards open science, open data, lots of discussions around um, sharing some information with whomever. I don't know if I'm going to touch exactly on the question, but just based on some of the research that we've done, um, and Steve included, um, we've looked at understanding, you know, data sharing and how people um, feel when they have to open up their data, uh, scientific data, for example. And a lot of researchers that right now still feel apprehensive about it, especially when it's data that could lead to exposing where vulnerable species are, um, you know, to poachers, for example. There's a paper that Steve and I had written about potential having unintended consequences you know you may have great intentions to open up your data and you want people to have access to it but there may be some unintended consequences where uh, people might use it to track um, an endangered species or or um, you know something valuable a species that can that are valuable and so um, there's a lot of thinking around open access, open, open data, and open science. Um, a lot of discussions around there. So I think, uh, I don't know where I'm going with this, I'm going in circles, but essentially, um, I think it will change things. People, we notice more and more people uh, want to better understand science. Um, some of, through some of my interviews even, um, people have noticed or have commented that everybody wants to hire their own scientists now to either defend their position or, you know, they just don't believe the one scientist, so they want their own researcher to look into the same issue. And so um, I'm not sure what it would look like, uh, but I do think it, it could change uh, the landscape. I'm not sure in the, it, could, it would be both, I think, in a beneficial way, but there are obviously um, potential for unintended consequences as well. Great, thank you. Okay, our next question, we're gonna keep going here. We've got a bunch more. Thanks for throwing those questions into the, uh, uh, into the uh, Q and A box, keep them coming. Uh, so the next one comes from Jessica. What are some tips or advice uh, from your experience for how researchers can earn trust and respect uh, with stakeholders and come across as genuine, not book smart know-it-alls? Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. So I think t like spending time in, with these uh, knowledge users, you know, with communities, uh, getting not just getting to know them as people as well and, and really opening, making yourself vulnerable is really important because you don't know it all. I mean, researchers don't know it all. And so we need to be vulnerable and be able to learn um, from these, you know, anglers, from these um, communities, uh, learn about what they see every day uh, when they go fishing or when they go hunting. And so that's uh, spending that time and not always going about like, okay, now I want to do my research. And so I think um, it becomes really hard because a lot of the structures that are in place right now for research, um, the funding structures especially, doesn't account for all of that time that you might want to spend to build these relationships to spend with these um, knowledge users. And so we are currently still constrained by how much funding is available uh, to be able to travel to some of these remote places, for example, or to, um, to spend that time getting to know the users. Um, and so there's still some work to be done, but those are some, I guess, uh, tips, I suppose, or um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Cool, thanks. Okay, we've got the next one from Austin. So uh, he's making the observation that the science we usually see in, in traditional media 
uh, that comes from journal articles is stuff that's, you know, got a cool angle to it, or there's something about it that's a little bit edgy. Uh, what are the other, you know, how, how do we get our science? Because most of it isn't edgy nor, you know, inherently cool. Uh, so how do we get that information to be picked up and embraced by, by media, not just the, the real weirdo, funky stuff? <laughs> I struggle with that myself, actually. When I when I first was thinking about uh, the Science Cafe talk, I was like, who wants to know how knowledge is being used? Like, I don't know. Like, I'm just interviewing people. And it was just, it took me a while to try and find a hook or, or, um, or an angle that would be meaningful to, to the audience. And so, um, I think being able, I, I'm not a guru at this or anything, but my personal opinion is more so if you can kind of step back from your research and think about what are some creative ways or potential ways that your research can be used. Uh, you know, we have a lot and there's definitely um, a lot of fundamental research that is needed. And if you can step back and be like, uh, and think about, just be creative, like, um, how can this research one day be used? Or uh, if if someone took this and did something with it, um, how could it change the world? Or how, um, how, what, how would it affect society? Um, maybe uh, that's a way to find a hook to it. Um, I've, attended or I've worked when I was at Natural Resources Canada, we worked with um, fiction, fictional writers, I guess, or people who write science fiction. And I thought it was really interesting um, interacting with them because they they have that creativity of being like, okay, so, you know, um, it's just kind of opening your mind and trying to take you out of your box to find that hook. And so maybe even collaborating with, with, um, more not saying that we are not creative but more creative um people could also help um kind of expand that box great all right so i'm going to uh, sort of mesh together two questions that come from barbara and they're about statistics uh but don't worry we're not going to get mathy here the question is about science literacy in the the general public and, and frankly, in the media as well, and the reality that most people don't understand statistics, uh, yet at the same time, that's sort of a, a language and a currency that, that we deal in quite a bit. So how, what can scientists help to do to sort of a, a address that issue? Um, yeah, what can we do to you know, address the, the lack of understanding of statistics in their audience you know, publics of all sorts. Mm -hmm. Addressing the lack of literacy around statistics is essentially the question. Uh, um, yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, without changing, for example, the education and the curriculum, um, how can we better equip the public to, I guess, interpret statistics? Yeah, and I'll, I'll throw in some context here. I remember the, you know, the first stats course I ever took was introduced with the statement that uh, it was the first class uh, that statistics never lie, but liars use statistics. That there's always context. And I think we see that, especially with COVID, you know, the same data graphed in different ways can tell a different story. And I think it's confusing to people. So any thoughts on how to help people sort through that? Yeah, um, trying to think here. It's a really, it's a great question, a really tough one. And I can't, yeah, it's hard to answer that without saying, you know, maybe we just need to educate people earlier on how to interpret, you know, data um, and how, and also not only um, the public on on interpreting data, but also, you know, train our researchers in, in visualizing data that maybe is a little bit more palatable 
for the public. Um, more and more we have data science being a huge, uh, you know, AI data science um, becoming bigger and bigger now. And I think we're, we are moving towards that because data is becoming so important in our everyday lives. And so I think, um, yeah, training amongst our researchers now to, to visualize it in a, uh, yeah, an, um, accurate way or easy to interpret way is, is one way we can do it. But then on the other end to, um, it, introduce data and um, interpreting data earlier on in um, our education system can also help meet in the middle. Great. All right. The next question comes from Holly, uh, who I believe is a science undergrad. And her question is about uh, you know, the value in doing a master's in science communication or you know whether it's better to just simply you know focus on doing more interdisciplinary work and the science communication just sort of comes along on the side with it uh you don't have a particular degree or training per se in science communication uh yet you're very nimble and active in in this space so thoughts um, yeah so i guess it depends on the end goal um Science communication is inherently interdisciplinary in, uh, in, on it, in itself. So going towards doing more interdisciplinary work versus going explicitly into science communication, I think um, it does depend on like your sort of uh, career objective or, or end goal. Um, some, for example, some jobs will require you to have a piece of paper. So if you are set on a science communication job, you want to work with like other, for, for example, journalists or anyone, um, they often do, I think, require having, you know, a piece of paper that validates that you have done training in science communication or any other kind of communications training. Um, whereas if you want to continue um, applying science communication in your research or your work. Um, I don't think having to go down a formal science communication training is necessary. Um, but being cognizant of what you're doing and learning and reading um, and surrounding yourself with experts who uh, will help you develop those skills. Um, and so I guess in the, the short answer just depends on um, maybe where you want to go or where your career path, um, where you want to head. Excellent here. I'm just waiting through. There's a few more questions here that have come in. Um, you touched on the importance of social networks in knowledge flow. What role do you think social network uh, model, network analysis could have in enacting new dialogue or participatory models? Um, that's a great question because I really want to get into social network analysis. Um, I haven't yet been able to, but I have seen very cool studies where, uh, for example, in the Great Lakes uh, area, there's lots, just multiple jurisdictions, you have lots of um different organizations interested in the same resource for example of fisheries and so i've seen interesting work where you can help using social network analysis you can identify some hot spots of this is a per this organization or this person um is like the key go-to person for many of these other people or these other actors um that are interested in you know whatever issue or and so it really does help identify uh for example like a champion somebody you can actually work with to, or al um to be an ally with to uh to it's not spread message but um but basically like um communicate your work and sort of uh try and make an impact that way I don't know if I went on a tangent or if I asked, if I answered the question. 
Tangents are allowed. Tangents are allowed. All right. Uh, I think we'll go with one last question here before we wrap things up. There's more in the, the chat room here, but uh, we're going to try and keep this to an hour. Um, so uh, Shirley has a question. I'm thinking that doing science alone is a big enough challenge. Why burden science scientists further with having to be mass communicators? Maybe there's other elements of the so-called pipeline that we could improve. Thoughts? Yeah. Um, I'm very glad that Shirley brought that up. Uh, it's true. Not everyone uh, is a good communicator or should communicate. Uh, there are some researchers who are passionate about it and really do want to be involved in the communication and, and get their hands, you know, dirty with, um, with, with music group. That sounded bad. <laughs> Um, but there are definitely ways to um, include, you know, knowledge brokers, for example, is another term that uh, we often use in this knowledge mobilization sphere or field is that there are people who are just very good at speaking both languages of researchers and of, you know, policy, for example. And so they uh, formalizing these roles, having more of these knowledge brokers could also help um, uh, communicate science without the researchers having to take on that ownership. Because again, not everyone uh, should or wants to be that communicator. Um, and, and yeah, like as, as uh, we, if we go back to that first question about the media, um, the media has a role to play as well. We have, you know, good media who, who portray more accurate um, communications of science and then some that are less accurate. So um, I'm not sure where that's going to go, but, but just knowing those credible sources. I know we've talked about Twitter in one of the classes I was teaching um, for science. I, I was guest lecture for it, but we had a speaker come in you know, just talking about like, can we rank like um, different sources? Is there like a crowd vote for like, this is a credible source or not? Um, not policing social media, but it was just kind of musing about ways to uh, vet where there may be good sources versus bad ones. Um, and yeah, some of my thoughts. <laughs> Yeah, and then of course the challenge that that all knowledge is political, and so yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, this has been fun, uh, informative. So uh, I'd really like to thank you on behalf of the faculty of science. Of course, our audience members, thank you for participating and and throwing some some good questions at us. Uh, really appreciate it. Stay tuned for the next episode of the Science Cafe. It will be online, uh, uh, and we hope to see you there. Thanks so much. Thank Take care you. All.